Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to The Correct Views, where I don't know how to trigger my own theme song. Uh, for those of you that want to hear the whole song, it's called Turmoil. It's by Passing Time, and you can find it at uh, YouTube. Friends, welcome to The Correct Views. Got a lot of news to get to. Uh, it's good to start off in a good mood, because unfortunately, a lot of the news we have to get, for, get to is absolutely dreadful. So uh, maybe a little bit of levity at the beginning was a blessing in disguise. How many of you have repeatedly heard a number of people in the quote-unquote liberty movement or whatever it is that you want to call it this week um, siding with Russia simply because he's not Obama? Obama is tied into things like the uh, globalism as Obama is. I mean, as Putin is. There's no difference between them. That's like you telling me that you're going to vote for Jeb Bush just because she's not Hillary. Just because he's not Hillary. That doesn't make any sense. He's, he's dreadful. So, you see that, you know, obviously, listening to me, uh, say it. You're, oh, I'm definitely not going to go ahead and vote for Jeb Bush. However, maybe you're giving Putin a pass. Now, I also understand that America is egging Russia on by interfering where it shouldn't and uh, funding organizations that can uh, very clearly at least show that there are percentages, rather growing percentages, of Nazis in their ranks. And we're doing it right on their border. Well, how would we feel about Russia promoting Nazis on the Canadian border? Would we like that? Probably not, especially if we were half at war with Canada. Oh, hey, but... What I've tried to do for everyone, and I want you to listen to it, before you before you critique anything I've said, listen to all three stories, because I think there is a common sense way to approach this that does not involve us praising a madman and doesn't involve us um, giving a green light policy to Obama. How, how about that? And uh, let me know what you think in my comment line when you're done. I think this is going to be pretty fair-minded. Why an American and Russian general are suddenly very worried about nuclear war? This is from Zero Hedge. Over the past several years, there has been an alarming escalation of two very disturbing trends. An increasing preponderance of cyber attacks on complex infrastructure, whether domestic or abroad, or whether instigated by external sources or internally in a false flag attempt. In other words, it doesn't matter how the hacking happened, just that it did. Says so well, it happens all around the globe, and a largely unexpected return to the Cold War footing has happened. One ca catalyzed, catalyzed by the violent U.S.-sponsored overthrow of the former Kiev government, and the eagerness to escalate the resultant conflict exhibited by the Kremlin. Basically, there are three ways, and only three ways, that nuclear issues are dealt with in terms of a launch from one country to another. And it says, due to the porous nature of this technology and the increasing prevalence of cyber attacks, the Cold War era nuclear doctrines and rising tensions between the two superpowers are now back to our Cold War regime. And the reason that this is bad is it says in an op-ed, the authors state that there are three Cold War legacy strategic options at the two countries' disposal. That means there are three ways to which you will handle a nuclear attack. That will be a first strike, uh, that would be retaliation after an attack, and a launch on warning. Now, please do not zone out. I'm going to explain what all, what all of these are, and I'm going to do it really easy. That's why you tuned in. The generals opine that the latter is the riskiest scenario. So launch on warning is the one that we're most concerned with here. Why? Because provocations or malfunctions can trigger a global catastrophe. Since computer-based information systems have been in place, the likelihood of such errors has been minimalized. But the emergence of cyber warfare threats has increased the potential of false alerts in early warning systems. The possibility of an error cannot be ruled out. Do you realize how many times both the United States and Russia, you can look it up, it's, it's public domain information, they have almost launched nuclear attacks on each other repeatedly due to glitches. 
Or a cyber attack would be different. A cyber attack could tell you that you were attacked by a full arsenal when you weren't. You could potentially launch a system. I've heard of instances where certain uh, programs are made in like what, what uh, Stanley Kubrick would have called a doomsday scenario, where if the computer program realizes that an enemy is in it, it gets to make decisions. Um, I know that's been backed away from lately. Anybody who knows the status on that, comment lines are wonderful. It says, while one can be skeptical that in the current environment of renewed animosity between East and West, the two countries will sit down and amicably discuss a nuclear disarmament, the reality of a nuclear strike, should a hacker find their way into the U.S. or Russian launch system and bypass the launch codes, is indeed all too real, as is the assured response by the adversary, giving way to a global nuclear holocaust that is you and your loved ones your babies your dogs cooked skin sloughing off the bones as they said about uh mayak and uh unfortunately japan it says in this day and age when a new war seemingly starts every month in a desperate neocon boost to stimulate the military industrial complex that we live in it does not sound too far-fetched at all Finally, those cynical enough can say that the two generals have done it simply to lay out a blueprint of the next steps. In other words, they're letting you know what's about to happen to you. How do you avert the nuclear war? Well, <clears throat> it says we find ourselves in an increasingly risky strategic environment. The Ukrainian crisis has threatened the stability of relations between Russia and the West, including the nuclear dimension as became apparent last month when it was reported that Russian defense officials had advised President Vladimir V. Putin to consider placing Russia's nuclear arsenal on alert during last year's crisis in Crimea. Now, if you say, well, how could you blame Putin for doing that? It happened right on his border. If he would have moved his non-nuclear, his conventional weapons, to the border and said, ha -ha, I wouldn't have a problem with it. He's talking about dropping nuclear bombs over a, 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 a dispute about Crimea. I understand that America and NATO, and I'm no big fan of NATO, long-time listeners know this, I'm no huge fan of the UN, they lied and said that we were not going to encroach on Russia's border after the fall of the Soviet Union in 91. And guess what we have? However, Obama, who I'm no fan of at all, did not bring nuclear weapons to the table, at least unless it comes out later that he did. He's dumb enough to that I wouldn't be surprised, but to the best of knowledge, no, he did not. Now, again, we don't know if Putin listened to his um, defense officials, but the point is that is either uh, saber-rattling to intimidate the enemy, that would be us, or that is an extremely hard-handed approach. And that is somebody who, if it's true, would very much launch a nuclear strike on somebody because this, this situation, I'm sorry, did not warrant that. Um... The Cuban Missile Crisis was one thing, because that, of course, involved nuclear weapons that were on our border. But we wouldn't break out nuclear weapons to prevent Mexico from smuggling drugs into the country. Are you feeling me here? Dying of thirst, excuse me there. Diplomatic efforts have done little to ease the nuclear tension. It says this makes it all the more critical for Russia and the United States to talk to relieve the pressures and to of the use-or-lose nuclear forces during a crisis and minimize the mistaken launch. So here's what's happening. It says, from either side, the decision to launch on warning, again, we explained what that is, when the computer warns you, or for, in, in other ways, it's option number three. In an attempt to fire one's nuclear missiles before they are destroyed, would be made on the basis of information from early warning satellites on ground and, and ground, ground, ground radar. Given the 15 to 30 minute flight times of strategic missiles, a decision to launch after an alert of an apparent attack must be made in minutes. 
mere minutes, you have to decide whether or not to launch this or whether or not it was a mistake in the computer program or a hack. Do you realize that this has happened repeatedly and thankfully the nations and the presidents at the time of both uh, the Soviet Union and the United States were wise enough to not do it? It says this is therefore the riskiest <coughs> scenario. <coughs> Since provocations or malfunctions can trigger a global catastrophe, since a computer-based information systems have been in place, the likelihood of such errors has been minimized. But the emergence of these cyber warfare threats has increased the potential for false alerts and early warning systems. The possibility of an error cannot be ruled out. It says um, another problem is, Americas have downplayed the launch on warning option. They have argued that instead for the advantages of a post-attack retaliation, which would allow more time to analyze the situation and make an intelligent decision. Neither the Soviet Union nor Russia ever stated explicitly that it would pursue a similar strategy. But on emphasis on mobile missile launchers and strategic submarines, continues to imply that a similar reliance on the ability to absorb an attack and carry out retaliatory strikes. What's all that mean, Sam? That was a bunch of words. It's saying that it doesn't look like we have enough cool heads to prevail here. That, again, if, if we had missiles fall, we would have time very likely to get our missiles up. And, of course, whatever is left would be a poison wasteland. But you have to take a huge risk to do that. Well, it says today, Russia's early warning system is compromised. The last of the satellites that would have detected missile launches from American territory and submarines in the past has stopped functioning this fall. That has raised questions about whether Russia even can notice a launch on warning attack. Well, if Putin and the Russians are doing such a great job with their country, how is it that they didn't have the intelligence, money, or wherewithal to replace these satellites that could prevent a nuclear war? Instead, they've put themselves in a situation through their own negligence and lack of intelligence and space design to preempt it. Or to, I should, that's a bad word, to, uh, to analyze it properly. How's that? Don't tell me that Russians doing everything right here because they're not any more than the U.S. is. It says, partly to compensate for the loss of its space-based system, Russia has deployed prefabricated radar units that can be set up quickly along its borders. Some of these are already operational, some are still being tested. Unlike satellite networks, radar can provide accurate information about the scale and targeting of a missile attack, but only once a missile has entered its vicinity, which would most likely be 10 to 15 minutes after launch. So it says, clearly for either side, these timelines are very compressed, and the opportunities for ill-considered decisions are very real. We call them dumdies. Launch on warning puts enormous strain on the nuclear chains of command in both countries. So what do you do? How do you fix it? Well, listen, there's a couple more paragraphs here, and they're important. In theory, no sensible head of state would authorize a launch on warning strike after receiving information from just one missile, but or a small number of missiles even, even if they were inbound, on the assumption that it was not an intentional full-scale attack. In other words, if just a missile or two come over, you could be pretty sure that Russia knows they're not going to be able to defeat the United States by launching two nuclear missiles. So it's probably an error, or it's probably a false, um, a false computer issue. It says, the launch on warning doctrine still rules in both Russia and the U.S., in which case the risk, however small, of cataclysmic error remains. In other words, the official policy is that if you see a missile, you can blow up the whole world over it. It says, this risk should motivate the presidents of Russia and the U.S. to decide in tandem to eliminate the launch on warning concept from their nuclear strategies. They may reinstate military to military talks, which were suspended over the Ukraine crisis to pursue this stand down as an urgent priority. So we're talking less <clears throat> as we get angry with them over the Ukraine issue. That's, that's great. A joint decision on this would not destabilize nuclear de deterrence 
Both countries still have nuclear forces designed to withstand a first strike attack, guaranteeing retaliatory strikes. In other words, it would not mean that you would lose the war. The footing would be even. To reinforce this accord, it goes on, both countries should refrain from conducting military exercises that involve practicing missile launches based on information from early warning systems. Even if this restraint cannot be fully verified, it would be a valuable contribution to a strategic stability and, of course, to preventing an inadvertent nuclear war. In other words, if you got caught doing it, it would be a black eye for the country. It's a good policy to have in place. This would be a positive step ahead of the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference that the United Nations will host later this month. Detailed verification measures can come later once we have better America-Russia relations. Uh, the technical implication of a decision to abandon the launch on warning concept would fall within the framework of a new START treaty. Friends, there you go. An American and Russian general who know what they're talking about. And again, for those of you maybe that are not completely up on exactly what the issue is going on here, we're going to go over two more stories that are dealing with all things Ukraine, Russia, and West here. As I have said all along, the Ukraine is largely its own problem. Why do they have to be a member of the EU? Why do they have to be a Russian uh, protectorate? Why can they not be just Ukrainian? And if they can't, why should I feel bad for them? If you're trusting Daddy Putin or, God forbid, Angela Merkel, the EU, or Russia, then you're an idiot. Who would want that for their country? Didn't Chernobyl teach you in the Ukraine anything? Or did it just make you so mentally dumb that you all became Nazis? Listen to this. Neo, Eric Dreister. The U.S. is training Nazis. The Western media is providing cover. It has become a popular position in the mainstream and pseudo-alternative media and among those on the Russia-phobic left to downplay the significant fascist influence on the political and military institutions, as well as the cultural character of the new Ukraine. Quite often, the reality of Ukrainian fascism is obscured by vague assertions that such conclusions are merely Russian propaganda that they are simply Kremlin talking points and not statements of objective reality. In other words, there's no Nazis around today. You ain't got to worry about Nazis. America would never fund Nazis. Well, do you know that Ford and Rockefeller funded uh, both sides of the war, America and Germany? It's true. Look it up. Indeed, it says influential political figures such as the ever-hilarious John McCain and Jen Psaki and global media brands like the, U the Guardian and Fox have all rushed to the nearest camera or Twitter account to proclaim that Ukraine is free and that we should stand united with it. Carefully embedded in these, please, is the notion that the Ukraine is democratic and that whatever ultranationalists, which is code language for fascists, fascists and Nazis, they're merely a marginal influence at best. Now, how many of you, and I st I, I've, I've probably seen in... It's about every Hitler documentary ever made. Do you realize what a very small number of people the Nazis were when they took over the country? They were not the majority. They were, they were a very small marginal influence as best. They thought that they could control the Nazi party, and they ended up with a nightmare. It says such... Statements belie the inescapable fact that Nazis make up an important strata of both the political and military establishment. And we're siding with them. Moreover, they are intended to provide cover for U.S. policy, which provides these elements, which the support that they need to influence the political development of the country and persecute its illegal war against the people of Donsk and Lugansk. An issue is not whether everyone in the Ukraine is a Nazi, and that is an absurd argument that no one is really making. Rather, it says, the question has to do with precisely which individuals and factions that are unmistakably fascist are being supported, directly or indirectly, by the U.S. and its allies. More to the point, which of the U.S.-backed Nazi elements are integral to the continued illegal war against the East, and which figure prominently in the trajectory of the Ukraine state? What's that mean? 
is it easier to side with Nazis and hide it in the media and to create this image that that's just a small, easily controlled group of people and close your eyes to history and to what not Nazism is and how it works? Says, arming Nazis to fight for democracy. The war in the Ukraine is being prosecuted by the U.S.-backed government in Kyiv using all available means. While, of course, the regular Ukrainian military force, which is also armed and trained by the U.S., are fighting this war alongside them and in concert with them, there are outright Nazi elements, too, who, like their regular army brethren, are receiving direct support from Washington. Your tax dollars going to fund Nazis. The Associated Press reported on March 31, 2015 that the United States plans to send soldiers to the Ukraine in April for training exercises with units of the country's National Guard. The units to be trained include the Azov Battalion, a volunteer force that has attracted criticism from its far-right sentiments, including brandishing an emblem widely used in Nazi Germany. Pause. Notice the way that that was written. First of all, look up Azov Battalion. Uh, I, I did before this report, and they are, in fact, very Nazi-leaning. Proudly so. Notice the way they word this. Including brandishing an emblem widely used in Nazi Germany. It says, of course, first and foremost is the fact that the U.S. military will be on the ground in Ukraine providing direct support for the Ukrainian military. Isn't that precisely what Russia, what Washington accuses Russia of doing while failing to provide evidence? Well, they have. Russia has done it. Namely, providing direct military support on the ground. But it says, leaving aside such pesky questions as to the hip hypocrisy and accountability, there is still an even more salient point. Now, please, please, please listen to this. The language employed in the Associated Press article essentially whitewashes the true nature of the Azov Battalion, who they are and what it is that they stand for. AP refers to criticism of them for its far-right sentiments, including brandishing an emblem widely used in Nazi Germany. Unpack that deliberately, <clears throat> deceptively circumspect language, and it becomes clear that there is a fear, if not an outright refusal, to call the battalion what they are, Nazis. It is not far-right sentiments that Avov holds. Far-right sentiments might be American libertarian, libertarian supporters of Ron Paul or even supporters of Marine Le Pen in France. Azov Battalion instead have fascist sentiments that include advocating the ethnic cleansing to purify the Ukraine. No, that's, that doesn't sound like a Nazi at all, does it? They talk of one nation for one people and other such Nazi slogans. But don't take my word for it. For Foreign Policy Magazine. Unfortunately, among the Ukrainian people today are a lot of Russians. But then this is, this is what they said. This is what uh, uh, is quoted from the Avon Battalion literature from just last year. Unfortunately, among the Ukrainian people today, there are a lot of Russians by their mentality, not their blood. Kikes, which is a derogatory word for Jewish people. Americans, that would be you and I, Europeans of the Democratic Liberal European Union, Arabs, Chinese, and so forth. But there is not, so, there is not much specifically Ukrainian. The reason for this situation is the mass propaganda of trans myth that the foreigners tell us through advertising, television, laws, and education. It's unclear how much time and effort will be needed to eradicate these dangerous viruses from our people. So they're calling us dangerous viruses, and we are funding them. Did you notice that Americans were in the list? And we're funding them. So if you don't join the European Union, you have to be a fascist? You have to be a fascist to be Ukrainian. That doesn't make any sense either. It says, this conception of the nation as a rotten and impure because of its perceived degenerate elements is a hallmark of all fascist organizations, from the Ku Klux Klan to Hitler's Nazi party. These are most certainly not, as the AP referred to them, far-right sentiments. Such views are not even nationalistic, in the broadest sense of the word. 
They are deeply racist and fundamentally rooted in bigotry. So, friends, that's who we're funding. That's who we're funding. And, listen, again, I, I want to point out the way they word this. It says, returning to the AP article, the inexplicable use of the phrase brandishing an emblem widely used in Nazi Germany is deeply troubling. An honest description would simply be brandishing Nazi emblems, a clear statement that would get the point across. Instead, the reader is left with the notion that somehow Azov uses an emblem, in this case the wolf sangle, that just happened to be used during the Nazi regime, rather than a symbol deeply embedded in the collective memory of Nazism in that region. This goes hand in hand with the utterly absurd obfuscations of Azov members themselves who claim that their swastikas and other symbols are just indicators of their interest in Nordic mythology. Or as one of the Avov members told the Guardian, the swastika has nothing to do with Nazis. It is an ancient sun symbol. Okay, that is true. That is very, very true. I wish they would have asked them to name one or two things about that ancient religion, and I bet they couldn't have. Why? Because they weren't using it for that. They were Nazis! Well, but nobody does follow-up questions anymore. While there may be some who are either shockingly ignorant or simply feign stupidity to mask their fascist ideology, the leadership in the Ukraine that relies on Azov and other such groups knows perfectly well what they are, who they are, and what they believe. So our media is covering for this. Our media is uh, saying what a great job we're doing in the Ukraine. Friends, do you realize we're funding Nazis here, thinking that we can control them? That's the same mistake that was made the last time that non Nazis were funded. Nazis. I almost called them Nazis. That would be a better name. Guys, the last of this, and we're going to move out of this Russian problem, though. This might be the most important of the three stories, so I'd like you to listen to it here. False east-west paradigm hides the rise of a global currency. Oh, but everyone likes Russia. They'd never do that. Despite popular belief, very few things in our world are exactly as they seem. This is from altmarket.com. That which is painted as righteous is oftentimes evil. It says, the fact is, nowhere is that more evident than in the growing tensions between the elites in the West and the elites of the East over the crisis in the Ukraine. Listen to every word that I'm about to say here, especially if you're somebody that thinks Putin is a great man just because he's not Obama. The writer says, I am continually astonished at the refusal of many otherwise intelligent people to consider the evidence or even the possibility that there is in reality no fundamental political or philosophical conflict between the power brokers of the East and the West. As outlined in great detail, and there's a link for this, it's called Russia is Dominated by Global Banks Too. The truth is they are both working toward the same goal. The U.S. and Russia are trying for the same thing. They both ultimately benefit from an engineered and theatrical display of international brixmanship. Russia, like the United States, is utterly beholden to globalist financiers through organizations like the International Monetary Fund, who you all dislike Obama's ties to, and the Bank for International Settlements. How many of you are fans of that? Hopefully no one. Russia's global economic advisor in matters ranging from investment image to privatization is none other than Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs has also worked closely with the Ukrainian government since 2011, and it started its advers adversary work in the Ukraine for free. Whenever Goldman Sachs does something for free, one should take special note. Yeah, because you're going to get hosed. Banking elites have been working both sides of the fence during Russia versus Ukraine charades. It goes on that Russia has continued to borrow billions of dollars from Western banks, including Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse, year after year, proving that they are not averse to the slightest to working closely with the evil Western robber barons. In other words, they work with the same evil entity banks that are often rooted here. Russian President Vladimir Putin meets the New World Order himself, Henry Kissinger, on a regular basis. Yeah, on a regular basis, him and Kissinger are buddy-buddy. It says, according to Putin's press secretary, they are old friends. Putin's meetings with Kissinger began almost immediately after he took office in 2000. No, no, Putin's not a one-world uh, uh, globalist. No, not at all. He hates Obama, so he must be God. You people are nuts. 
Putin's relationship with Kissinger has been so pronounced that the Russian Foreign Ministry gave Kissinger an honorary doctrine in diplomacy. <coughs> Excuse me. And Putin placed Kissinger at the head of a bilateral working group, along with former KGB head and multilateralist globalist general, here goes four names again, Yevgeny Primakov, oh, no, dealing with the foreign policy. In more recent news, it would also be good to remind pro-Putin cheerleaders that Putin and the Kremlin first pushed for the IMF to take control of the Ukrainian economy, and the IMF is now demanding that the Ukraine fight Russia in exchange for financial support. They helped cause this. This might seem like irony to more foolhardy observers, but to those who are aware of the false East-West paradigm, it is all part of the greater plan for the consolidating of power. Clearly, Putin and Russia are just two more puppet pieces on the globalist chessboard, pitted against other puppets in the West in a grand theater designed to distract and divide the masses through chaos. As Kissinger points out, in crisis there is opportunity. And what's the goal? They've already told us openly on numerous occasions. The first great prizes of the New World Order are a global currency. There are links to all of this in the article here at altmarket.com. And centralized economic control. The elites are not satisfied with quiet dominance of individual economies. They want complete political homogenization of the end of all sovereignty. That is, countries being their own. Period. With a global currency in place, the step, the step forward global government quickly be, picks up. Heads of state and around the world, including Putin, as well as international bankers and IMF representatives, have all publicly called for the IMF to take charge of the global economic system through its special drawing rights currency program. Do you still think Putin is such a great man? They want the U.S. dollar to fall. It must lose its world reserve status and most likely collapse in a relative value before the SDR can be elevated. This is where mainstream pundits lose track of the facts. <clears throat> For them, the dollar is an invincible monetary element, a currency product as infinite as time. Their normalcy bias prevents them from ever acknowledging the many weaknesses of the Federal Reserve note. Same banks funded by the same people that we hate, the same banks are funding Russia, the same people that create the problems here, same ones creating them there, and everyone wants to praise Putin. Well, guys, I've gone for over a half hour. Uh, there you go. That is your huge, massive update on all things Russia, Putin, Obama, and nuclear war related. Uh, share this with someone, especially if there's someone that is a Putin worshiper. And when they say, oh, the guy, who, what do you trust him for? Make sure they realize that everything I just gave to you has sources. And I told you where they are. All right, guys. Day after Obama removes Cuba from the terror sponsor list. The terror group sponsored by Cuba kills 10. David Sternberg, PJ Tatler. Yesterday, President Barack Obama announced that the United States would be removing Cuba from the U.S. state sponsors of terror list as part of his push to normalize relations with the communist dictatorship. But just hours later, a terror group long fostered by Cuba, even today the Castro brothers are harboring several wanted members of the group, murdered 10 Colombian soldiers and wounded 17 others in a terror attack on a military base. This is from uh, a, a G's France Press. Ten Columbia soldiers killed, 17 injured in West Columbia Wednesday in the dawn attack on an army garrison that officials blamed on the leftist FARC guerrillas. The attack occurred in a small town in Quipa Province. Governor Timotakalis Ortega told Blue Radio, adding that the four of the injured soldiers are in serious condition. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be opening up talks with Cuba. But we're removing everybody from terrorist lists, and I think that's a mistake. A Hamas. Hamas is everything that is terror. The the uh, Brotherhood? Are you kidding me? Muslim Brotherhood is everything that is terror. Guys, we got three stories left. I do, real quick, though, want to give a shout-out. I'm so happy to have them on the show as a sponsor. Sticker Junkie. Yes, that's right. I made this design in Photoshop. And David Lake at StickerJunkie.com turned it into these. This is the Paul Revere ones for our movie Becoming Paul Revere. You can find it online. 
Want a passing time sticker? Leave a comment. They were made by Sticker Junkie. And if you want stickers that look that good, <clears throat> then go to StickerJunkie.com and let them know, uh, hey, I heard about you from the correct views. David Lake. Sam said I get a discount. You will. Friends, <clears throat> that brings us to another story. We're going to get away from politics for just a minute here. Solar plane takes off on the first ever round-the-world trip without fuel. This is from RT, and it's brought to you by Change Transportation. If you're within a 50-mile radius of Canton, make sure you find out how much a cab's going to be where you are, and then call Change, Change Transportation. You can find them on Facebook. Let them know you heard about it from the correct views, and he'll likely price match it and or beat it. The second generation of the Swiss-engineered solar-powered airplane, Solar Impulse 2, has taken off from Abu Dhabi, heading east to Oman, its first checkpoint on a daring five-month journey around the globe. The aircraft, piloted by Solar Impulse founder Andre Borschberg, successfully lifted off from the United Arab Emirates capital on Monday morning. The record-breaking 35,000-kilometer journey has been split into 12 stretches with a total flight time of some 500 hours. The single-cabin plane will be piloted by Borschberg and Solar Impulse co-founder Bertrand Pickard. And I guess they're going to do it in turns, thankfully. The aircraft has a 236-foot wingspan, larger than that of a Boeing 747, and is covered in 17,248 solar cells that power four electronic motors. The plane weighs 2,300 kilos, about as much as an SUV. You might as well be up there in a tin can. But I hope it works. I mean, any, any progression of science within reason I'm in favor of. You all know that. Flying at around 500 to 100 kilometers per hour, the pilots plan to make a total of 15 landings for every five days of continuous flight. <clears throat> The Swiss pilots say that they want to raise awareness about switching from old polluting technologies to clean and efficient ones. Hey, I don't believe in global warming, but I don't want to breathe in cancer air. I'm in favor of this. It says the crew of 65 air traffic controllers and weather